Hey, Neil McDonald here. I'm going to get started in a few minutes with LinkedIn Live, letting people join. But before we do, I wanted to give you a tip just for those of you who are showing up kind of early. Um, if you're not tracking on my profile and the content I put out, I try to put out content that is only ever relevant to people who are in the federal government contracting space. And so an example, two examples. Today, I just uh, commented um, on something. So if you're watching my profile activity, you would have saw a thumbs up or a or comment. But um, uh, recently, a document was just put out, and this document had to do with the um, way contracting's done. And let me just remind myself. So it's the um, it's coming out of the Navy's, uh, where I learned about it was the Navy's research uh, and acquisition, research development and acquisition. So anyways, I did this on LinkedIn, but they just put out new um, content that's um, uh, that you can go into. And it talks about, this is 179 pages. So it's a deep dive, but it goes into the acquisition approach of the Navy. And I want to encourage you to go in and look at that and um, see how they're trying to acquire different services, in particular, how they're acquiring the um, uh, technology side of the house, emerging technology. So they talk a lot about it. So that's one thing I wanted to point out. Another one is if you're not tracking on um, uh, uh, PowerPoint briefs that the government puts out. I put another one out. I'm just trying to find it really quick so I can talk about it. Um, this one is from the Navy's PEO branch, uh, PEO MLB. And so if you go in there, um, you'll see that they have a data transformation. So if you're on the data side of the house, they're talking about how they want to transform in the Navy data services. Um, and this is 15 slides, I think, where you can go in and see them talking about how they're trying to manage data throughout the Navy and just replace data with whatever you sell. And somebody is putting out some deck or some document talking about it. So go look at my profile in the activity I did yesterday and you'll see this deck. And the reason I like it is they talk about what they're doing and what they want from industry, but then they also talk, uh, provide you names of people who are uh, key points of contact that you can get into. So anyways, two quick tips for you about just track what's out there that the government is making available and you'll be able to see um, uh, great tips from them and you'll get names that perhaps even come with phone numbers and emails. You can find some examples on my LinkedIn content. Again, I like to put those out every day. Um, so I think we're good to go. Uh, we're live. It looks like people can hear me, which is always good. Uh, hello to everybody who's uh, chiming in and saying hello. Uh, happy Friday to you as well. Today is April 29th, 2022. And today we're going to dive into um, why aren't federal buyers taking my calls? And I might actually spin that title a little bit on its head to say, how can I get buyers to take my calls? So we'll, we'll play there. If you don't know who I am, I'm Neil McDonald. I'm the president of the GovCon Chamber of Commerce. And welcome to my daily LinkedIn Lives, where I discuss process and procedures for you to achieve success in the federal marketplace. Um, sent for 20 years, I had to remember that for a second. Um, for 20 years, I've been a small business owner, just like many of you. Certainly, I've been in sales and business development capture in the federal market for that time. And since 2018, I've been teaching people just like you that government contracting is not a secret. It's just a process. And that process goes from A to Z and the steps in between. And what I'm going to talk a little bit about today is the process of getting people to take our calls. Uh, so let me go ahead and dive into that. As I'm going along, feel free to throw a comment in and I'll try to watch them uh, or Gus, who's, uh, Gus Phelps, who's on the team there, can monitor them and throw them my way. But if you've got questions about getting into doors, throw them in. Um, that, that makes this content a little bit more dynamic. So first, I just want to talk about the pain and tell me if, you're, if any of this sounds familiar to you before I get into talking about my recommendations for what you can do. Um, so the first pain I was thinking about when I was thinking about today's topic is the fact that uh, anytime I'm trying to call anybody, it's just going into their voicemail constantly. Um, you know, and sometimes I get the voicemail and it says voicemail is full. Does that sound familiar? Um, other times you might be calling somebody and, and they go, I'm not the right person. It's like, well, I haven't even said what I do. I'm not the right person. But it says right here, you're the right person. It's like, ah, well. Um, maybe you're the, the person who actually gets in and gets a meeting and you had that first call, but it goes nowhere. You felt like it went great. We, we had chemistry, we talked, but it didn't go anywhere. Uh, and, and this last one is uh, one that is one of my favorites because you think it went great 
And in fact, they tell you it great. It went great. They tell you they liked you. They like what your company does and sells. Um, they say, hey, we should work together. We should talk together. Whether you're talking to a teaming partner and they go, hey, we should work together. Or the government is like, oh, yeah, let's get together. We'll talk about opportunities, maybe areas you can help us out. And then crickets. You don't hear anything back. Um, in sales, uh, I like to call it sounding. Uh, if you're familiar with a whale, a whale comes up and you know does the whole spouting air and things like that. And then whales can dive deep, deep into the ocean. And we call that sounding when the whale, the customer, goes deep down in the water. You're like, where is it? And we're all sitting on the surface in our little boats waiting for the whale to come back up. And it's just sounding. And you got to wait and it'll come back up. Um, and so, you know, that's what I mean when I say crickets. If any of those sound familiar, then the tips I'm going to provide today are designed to try to address some of that pain you might be feeling or ex what you're experiencing when you um, are reaching out to federal buyers or even federal uh, teaming partners, small businesses, large, it doesn't matter. Um, if you're not getting people to call you back or take your calls, et cetera, then uh, that's what I want to address today. So um, in sales, we have this line that says, some will, some won't, so what? And what that means is some people will do what you want. Let's say a phone call. Some people will take your phone call. Some people won't take your phone call. So what? It's just life, right? And um, the sooner you realize that some will, some won't, you'll be able to say, so what? On the ones that don't take your call. Um, I remember when I got married, and I'm, I'm telling a personal story in here that I haven't got permission from my family to say, but it was so long ago. But when I got married, I have a large family. I have nine brothers and sisters. My mom, uh, she's gone now, but she has 22 grandkids, right? Big family, 41 of us in the immediate family picture. And um, that's just typical Irish family. The, uh, Anyways, I was coordinating all these people to mostly come from the West Coast to DC where I was getting married. And um, long story short, two of the 41 weren't going to be able to make it. And I was stressing out about that. My attention was going over there. It's like, What's going on? It was like one of my nephews was going to a really important high school track meet or something, whatever. But another one of my sisters made a really great point to me. She's like, uh, how long are you going to focus on the two who aren't coming and ignore the 39 who are coming all the way across the country to your wedding? And I was like, oh, my God. I was like, some will, some won't. So what? I shifted my attention away from the ones who weren't coming and, you know, the ones who aren't answering our calls. And I put the attention right where it belonged on the ones who are taking our calls, the ones who were coming to my wedding. So just keep that in mind and it helps you maybe get a little bit through the days where people aren't taking your call or that wail is sounded. Um, one thing that makes it easier for me when I get people who aren't responding or taking my calls or, or they, you know, they're, they sounded after we had a good meeting is I remember, I remind myself that these people are just people. Over the last four weeks, I've been doing daily LinkedIn lives. Uh, Wednesday, I had to miss the first one in seven weeks because I actually went to a dentist appointment that I couldn't get away with. But that dentist appointment was, I mean, the dentist was great, but the experience was miserable. And for the last couple of days, I, my mouth is hurt. It's just miserable. And so I'm not really responding as much to people on LinkedIn or email as I want to. I really try to stay in touch. And then earlier in this process, like, um, three weeks ago or something, for those of you who are following LinkedIn, I got um, really sick from this massive Washington DC pollen attack. And I just like run down, but I still came to my LinkedIn lives. Well, I did the lives and people could see me show up, but then I wouldn't show up offline, like to, to an email or follow up. I'd have to cancel a couple of meetings. And what I'm trying to tell you is that people have their own lives. If they're not responding to you 99% of the time, it's because of them. You know, it's not you, it's me. Right. And you have to accept the fact that um, that in this world, it generally is the other person. It's not you. Right. I'm going to give you some tips about how you can make sure it's not you. But just keep in mind, they have their own lives. They have, um, you know, the dentist, they, they get sick, they have, uh, you know, kids, they have whatever going on in their lives that might distract them from focusing their attention on you. So um, if you do that, it'll make it easier for you to go eh, some will, some won't. The other thing I wanted to mention is the bell curve and somewhere, somewhere along the lines, I'll show a picture. I might even show it on Tuesday's webinar, but basically if you're not familiar, a bell curve kind of goes like a bell, right? Up and down. And um, in the technology adoption bell curve, 
there are five stages. There's the innovator, two and a half percent of people are innovators. Think about an iPhone. They're gonna be the ones sleeping in a tent. Then the next 13 and a half percent are called early adopters. And these early adopters are the ones who show up first thing Monday morning after an iPhone has been announced, right? And then after that, you've got 34%. That is the early majority. And this is the bulk of the people. And they're not going to get an iPhone right away. They know they're going to get an iPhone, but they're just going to wait. They're going to let those early people test it out. Is there a bug? Things like that. You know, they'll, they'll get it a couple of months later, but they know they're going to get it. After that, on the second half are the late majority. These are the people who will not get the iPhone um, unless they change the, you know, their um, subscription uh, changes over with AT&T or whoever they say, Hey, you can get a new phone. Say, like, all right, I'll get it then. You know, but they're way on the outside only if my, um, uh, my cell phone subscription changes. And then the very last group of people, 16% are called laggards. They will never, in, in an iPhone, I'm a laggard. I will never change my iPhone unless I'm absolutely forced to. And what the bell curve tells us is that half the people basically aren't going to do anything that you want. So you really, of all the people you're talking to, it's 50%. And of that 50%, it's really only 16%, that early majority, excuse me, um, innovators and early adopters, 16% who will do what you say. And so if Apple is selling an iPhone, they're going to buy that iPhone right away. If you were trying to set up meetings with small business specialists or contracting officers, 16% are going to jump at it. Um, there's going to be small business specialists that go, yeah, I don't have time to talk to you. And you're like, what are you talking about? I thought we were friends. You know, I thought we were supposed to talk. They just won't talk to you. And the sooner you understand the bell curve and that really the people you're trying to talk to are that early uh, 16%, right? Innovators and early adopters. The sooner you realize that, the sooner you will be okay with getting 50% of the people you call say, no, I don't want to talk to you. Or they don't answer the phone or they say, yeah, we should talk and they don't follow up. It's okay. Some will, some won't. So uh, let's talk about some tips in this last uh, half of the live about um, what you can do to begin to uh, get increase the number of some wills, right? The first thing I want to mention is you need to be able to uh, make sure you're targeting the people most likely to take your calls and at the right time. So for example, uh, spamming is a great way of, of getting people not to take your call. And in the government world, I always say it's big enough that you can make a second first impression but it's small enough that if you annoy somebody, they're going to tell friends. Um, and, and when I talk about choosing the right group of people, you need to have a primary agency that you're going after. And uh, so let's say HHS. I was just talking with um, a new friend today, Brian, and I was saying, hey, go after HHS. When he goes after HHS, he's able to learn HHS, not just the people he's going to call, but learn the organization, look at their strategic plan and see a couple of things. By doing that early research and understanding it, when he calls them, he will be able to answer um, or address that person's uh, uh, feeling about somebody who's calling them about, do they, you know, are they just dialing for dollars or are they actually calling in and wanting to help me with a mission? And what I was struggling with there is this combination of another line that I really like is um, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. No one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And in business world, especially with the federal government, one of the ways that you can show how much you care is to understand their mission, to take the time to look at some documents. So then when you're calling them, you're able to communicate things like, hey, I was looking at your strategic plan. I was hoping we could have a call. Um, so research is a big tip for you there. The next one is when you're calling people, make sure you have a really uh, well scripted out uh, voicemail um, so when you're leaving a voicemail, first, it's the exact same one every single time. And second, it asks only one thing. And what I like to do is always ask for a meeting. If you're calling um, about an opportunity to a contracting officer and that's specific, then you can make that one thing just the, hey, I'm calling about this opportunity. I'd like to take five minutes of your time to ask you three quick questions or something, whatever it is. But make sure you have a voicemail script that shows your professionalism because your script will be so clean and you'll read it it will sound very prepared. The likelihood of somebody calling you back will uh, be larger. So um, <laughs> you're welcome, Crystal. Um, <clears throat> and I don't read all the comments. I just happen to see ones that pop up. So uh, I said, leave a voicemail script that, script that asks for one clear thing. The other thing is, 
when you're calling people, be careful of bum rushing them or, you know, like uh, they answer the phone. You're like, boom, you're coming in. You're putting all the uh, putting everything full bore out. Um, you know, you want to come in slowly. You've been researching them. You've been wanting to call them when they pick up the phone, especially on a cold call. They don't know who you are from Adam. Right. And so they need to come up to speed. And what I like to say is never, ever talk to somebody on the first call. When you call them, you should be trying to schedule a follow-up meeting. You know, hey, Jane, I was just calling today, hoping to get on your schedule next week to do an intro call. You know, are you available next week? Can we make that happen? Whatever it is. But the idea is to try to do it in the following week. And what I teach people in my course is that um, you, can, you can answer any questions they have by saying the reason I want to do it next week is so that I can be more prepared and make sure I'm not wasting your time. What would be a good time next week for us to connect? Um, my tip here is don't ever talk in the first call and try to give them everything and sell everything. What you want to do is to touch them several different ways, engage them several different ways by scheduling a meeting and then thanking them and following up and then having the meeting. These things will begin to imprint you and your company on their mind. Um, next tip is use a call plan. I've talked about this a lot in many other videos and I and I might even have a whole video that's just dedicated to it. But certainly next week on Tuesday, I talk about it in the webinar where I say, um, use a call plan when you're calling somebody. And that call plan has two main, main sections. One is a clear set of objectives, uh, your primary objective, this is what I wanna get out of this call and, and a secondary objective. And then the second main area are questions you're going to ask. And those questions and the objective should be answering the with them. What's in it for me? Because when, and not for you, by the way, for the person you're calling, when you call somebody and they're taking your call, whether it's a small business teaming partner, a large uh, teaming partner, or a federal agency uh, point of contact, all of these people, all of us intuitively are thinking to myself, ourselves, what's in it for me? You're calling me. What's in it for me? Um, and, and for nonprofits, maybe what's in it for me is just the, the joy that's down deep in my heart. Um, but for business side, there be there should be something. So when I call a small business teaming partner, what I'm thinking about is that uh, what's in it for them is that I can help them win more prime contracts, let's say, and I can help you look uh, even better to your customer so you win even more business. I want to help you with your customer. And it's the same thing when I'm calling the federal agency, really the whiff them for me is always around the mission. Um, I think we can help you with your mission going this this direction. If you're selling parts to the Department of VA, medical supplies, right? You're not just selling medical supplies, you're selling healthcare to veterans who have served this country. Having that whole thread of what's in it for me, I'll be able to deliver better healthcare because I'll be able to have a good supplier who's always delivering supplies on time, top quality, et cetera. Um, so it's not just, hey, I want you to buy my stuff. Hey, I just wanna give you my capability statement. Add a level of thinking around uh, your call preparation that says what's in it for me. The next tip for you is um, just have a regular clip when you follow up and and a, a clip, I just mean do this, do this, do this, do this. Don't just call them, leave a voicemail and walk away. And maybe this goes to a question I get asked a lot is how often is too often to follow up with somebody? You know, when am I being a pest? You're being a pest when they tell you you're being a pest, right? Um, now, if you're unclear about being a pest, just call me a couple of times and I'll tell you whether you're being a pest. But really, if you think about specific examples, if I call somebody and leave a voicemail and then I follow up and leave, send an email and then I follow up again with another voicemail trying to reach them, I could do this five and 10 times and I'm never being a pest because they have never had the courtesy or the time, maybe they're busy, right? They've never gotten back to me to tell me, Neil, I don't want to work with you. We don't do IT services or, you know, we don't build rocket ships here. We do healthcare. Okay, cool. Then I, I won't bug you anymore. But until you reach that person, then you're not being a pest. Um, uh, and, and so the regular clip is generally every three to five business days following up is not a bad thing until you reach them and you're just super polite in, in how you do it. Right. One of my favorite things to do when I send an email as a follow up is, hey, I, I know you're really busy. I'm just wanted to bring this to the top of your inbox. Right. Don't everybody use it at once. But that's a standard uh, line a lot of us use. I'm just resurfacing this to the top of your inbox because I'm sure you get a thousand emails. And um, 
And the reality is I get a ton of emails and I get people like you reaching out to me and asking me for uh, things I've said I'd follow up on or things that you want, you're hoping I can help you with. You're never bugging me. In fact, I think it's a, um, I think it's kind of irresponsible of us to not follow up because I want to help you. And if I haven't gotten back to you on something you said you were going to get back to me on, then um, it's not because I don't want to help you. It's just because I didn't get to it. And now maybe it's being buried under all these other emails. But if you resurface that, I'm going to go, oh, my gosh, Josh, I want to follow back up with you. I really do want to follow up with you. Um, uh, I just have to you know, make the time. And so my point with you is have a regular clip until these people are getting in um, with you, then it's OK to keep reaching out to them. And you want to be able to keep in mind that until somebody says no, the answer is always yes. Right. That's a sales thing. The answer is always yes. The customer or the other person has to say no to me. Um, again, there's this balance between being, you know, annoying and you just got to find that. Um, but generally, if you're just following up every three to five business days, trying to get that contacting officer to call you back or something, that's not being a pest. And that's a great way to have a regular clip. And it also leads to uh, being able to get them to take your calls. So I, I got one last tip I want to share, but I want to look at some of these uh, chats that I'm just seeing to see if any of them are questions. Glad people are engaging. I love seeing people engage. I've already seen people who are on this call just like you who are um, going offline and building relationships. And, and that's a great secondary value of this. Um, and some of you, by the way, come up as uh, LinkedIn users while I'm looking at my tool. I won't see who you are until later, but... Um, like Kelly over in Iowa, you come up as LinkedIn user, but because you put your name in there, I see you. Um, thank you for the uh, feedback, the compliments. I appreciate that. I'm here to provide you information that could be helpful to you. By the way, if you ever feel like um, adding, tagging somebody in this comment, that's always appreciative. Let them let people know that this is here. Looking at uh, Josh, uh, people with the things, the crickets drive me nuts. I'm with you. Uh, Crystal. And um, and really, I think Chris, crickets are a big uh, signal that the other person is just really busy. I, I never take it personal. Um, that's funny. So you both hate and love the sound of crickets. Uh, I've watched the cold calling series on GovCon, Chamber of Commerce, call plan, et cetera. Biggest question I have is, do you do your first contact via email, phone, and then... Ah, so if, if you saw that question, it's like, um, do I call them first? Do I leave a voicemail first, email, whatever? Here's my exact process. And I talk about this next week in the webinar. And yes, I am plugging the webinar since I got it coming up on, on uh, Tuesday. It's a free webinar on finding and building, starting and building relationships. But anyways, the first thing I always do is call and leave a voicemail because now I've got myself in their ear, right? Then a few hours later, I follow up with an email. Um, and then you begin to do a repetitive set of activities that work for you. But I always start with a phone call and then an email because too many people spam with email. But when you leave a voicemail, they're now hearing Neil, right? Or they're hearing you. And that's really helpful. Um, uh, coming down, better PMs, happy Friday. They are people with stuff going on. Josh, hey, Josh. Uh, hey, Robin, great Friday, and I'm going to have a good weekend. My sailboat's ready to go on the water. Um, okay, sales coaches, keep following up until they say, stop calling me, Crystal. Right. Um, yeah, so Crystal, if you're looking at Crystal's comments, they're great comments as a person is going through uh, doing this activity. Just, you know, uh, wait until they tell you to stop, but she has yet to find somebody who says stop. Um Great point. Oh, hey, one thing, Robin, you just said, and I'm going to use your you as an example. Robin says, you know, it's uh, I'm with Crystal. It's hard to do. One thing that can make your life easier, if you can figure out how to do this, some of you are fully billable and I get it. But for those of us who are basically full-time salespeople, we just kind of dabble in other secondary responsibilities. Time block one hour a day to pick up the phone. I'm telling you, I was horrible at selling vacuum cleaners door to door for the first month, you know, and, and by the way, that was a long time because I knocked on hundreds of doors um, getting into that point. And so lugging a vacuum cleaner. 
And it was the same thing when I started trying to call large primes. I felt really weird. But once you start doing it, you start realizing even the large primes are just people who go home and wash their car, mow the lawn, you know, check the mail, whatever, right? They're just people. And, and so if you time block nine to 10 every morning, or actually, you know, uh, uh, some of the best time is seven to 8 a.m. East Coast time. If you time block that and say, I'm starting and I'm ending and make sure you end, right? But just call. That's not the email follow-ups or any of that. Just pick up the phone and call people. If you do that, you will get more comfortable at it. And then you'll be able to, int- um, you know, include more of your own stories, et cetera, in there. But you got to get past a little bit of the nervousness. Um, for a higher volume of calls, try. Pre- <laughs> so Josh is talking about predictive uh, schedule moduling. So he's talking about Thursdays at 2 p.m., uh, which is interesting because that one seems like, uh, you know, just another time to call in. For the government space, federal side, I, I love calling in the morning because it almost always guarantees I get a voicemail. And my secret is I'd rather not talk to the person first thing. I want to leave a voicemail, follow up an email. I've touched them twice. And if I can get a meeting, now I can touch them five or six times before I get the call. Um, somehow I just blew through all my time just looking at it. Um, but I, I like going through these comments and I appreciate them, Josh and others, for putting them in. Um, amazing, helpful information. I'm glad you like it. Great tip. I can certainly block that time. There you go. Um, by the way, feel free to text me or, or ping me and say, hey, I'm, I'm making calls. I would love to be your uh, kind of just on the side um, accountability buddy, like LinkedIn or whatever. Uh, I'll cheer you on for sure. So, and then Crystal, great point uh, on that. Okay, so the last tip I wanted to give, and I already forgot what it was. Oh, and so I've been talking about this, is play the numbers game, right? I talked about the bell curve and and 16 out of 100 people are gonna take your call like right away and, and be the kind of person you wanna talk to. More often than not, we get the first 50 no's before we ever start getting to it. But just play the numbers game. If you call 20 people a day, you're calling 100 people a week, you're calling 5,000 people a year. 5,000 people you're reaching out to a year, just in that time blocked one hour, 20 people, let's say. That's very doable. And when you play those numbers games, you're going to find that people go, oh my God, I'm so glad you called. I've been waiting for somebody just like you to call. So um, play the numbers game and understand that some will, some won't. So what? It's a good day to be calling, uh, calling customers and teaming partners. So I hope you have a great weekend. Remember government contracting. It's not a secret. It's just a process. I'll see you next time.